Today's session will focus on arbitrator training. We'll be kicking off with a panel discussion on pre-appointment checks, the disclosures, accepting an appointment as an arbitrator. Arbitrator, running efficient arbitration and managing parties and counsel. The panelists for this segment are Ms. Sally Harpo, international arbitrator, Dr. Michael Huang, SC, senior counsel and chartered arbitrator, Professor Liu Jindong, Director of International Economic Law Department, the Institute for International Law Studies for Chinese Academy of Social Science. Professor Lu Song, Professor of Law of China Foreign Affairs University. Mr. Lawrence Tech, Senior Partner, Denton Sprodick and the Davidson LLP. Moderating this session is Professor Lawrence Bu, member of SIC Court of Arbitration, independent arbitrator, and of the arbitra arbitration chambers. So, Professor Bu, please. Thank you, and uh, thank you, Chun Yuan, and uh, to uh, a very good morning to everyone who is attending this course. I understand you had a great time yesterday, and uh, I hope you are going to have a better time today. Uh, we have, as introduced by Chun Yuan, a very uh, distinguished uh, panel. I will not go through their CVs again, but uh, uh, you will have uh, seen from the uh, introductory introduction by Chun Yuan who they are. They're all well-known and experienced people. So I think we're gonna start right away. Um, the, the, today's focus is on your role as an arbitrator and how you would um, conduct an arbitration. But the first thing, coming first things first, and we are right in front, first things. That is accepting an appointment. It's quite often being, being appointed as an arbitrator uh, is quite a uh, very normal, easy man manner where parties simply nominate you or you are appointed by the uh, institution. But there are times when you are approached and you are asked before we, we are considering you as a candidate, but before we do so, we would like to have an interview with you or our clients are gonna have an interview with you. So the question that I would like to pose to our, our uh, speakers today is uh, firstly, how do you uh, respond to such a request? Would you uh, agree to an interview? Why would you not agree to an interview? What would you say during an interview? And what would be, what have been your experience? And I'll ask uh, to start off with maybe uh, Ms. Sally Harpo. Can you help us uh, to uh, break the ice today? I need to unmute myself, sorry. Uh, thank you very much um, for the kind introductions. It's an honor to be here and I hope that uh, everybody who's attending finds this to be productive. I'd like to start off by um, saying why this is important. Uh, this morning we're talking about the pre-appointment interviews and conflicts and issues like that. Why is it so important? I have to say, I'm, I'm in the United States, and of the various set-aside cases that we see where parties are applying to set aside a, an arbitral decision, a good number of those are because they thought that one arbitrator was biased. This issue comes up uh, not only at the beginning of the process, but it can come up even after the final award has been issued. So it's an issue, it, this is a topic that has to be taken extremely seriously because very often, if there are problems in the, the party's perception about the independence and neutrality of the arbitrator, those perceptions could begin right at this stage. So this is really uh, important. It's an important time to take into account the protocol and the rules. Uh, my experience with pre-appointment interviews is this. Uh, the most common situation is that I will get either a phone call or an email from a party who is searching for an arbitrator. Um, sometimes it's very simple, too simple. The party will say, um, are you available? And we have some parties in this case. I prefer to get it in writing if possible so that we have a written record of what has transpired in the communication. So if they do call me by the telephone, I you normally will ask, would you please send me an email with the full names of the parties so that we can be sure there's not a conflict of interest? And if the con there is no conflict, my usual next question is, would you mind sending, sending me a text of the party's arbitration agreement? 
because I want to see in that arbitration agreement if there are specified uh, qualifications for the arbitrators. Do I meet all of those qualifications? And is there any prohibition against ex party communications? Uh, if there is a prohibition against ex party communications right there in the party's agreement, we don't go any further with the interview. It stops there. Um, it's relatively unusual that parties want to go further than an email exchange in clarifying conflicts and qualifications. But um, I have had the experience, uh, particularly with in-house counsel, um, I've had that experience. And perhaps because um, if they're not in a law firm, <clears throat> they're not frequently traveling, uh, perhaps they're not as familiar with the pool of arbitrators. And so it's sort of something more new to them. They feel um, that they want to get closer before they can um, make a decision. And I, I would say this, um, in reviewing the CIAR, the CIR uh, guidelines, the um, guidelines on interviews for prospective arbitrators, you have some very, very useful instructions. Um, the bottom line there is take contemporary notes so that you have a written record of exactly what goes on. Also, take control over the framework set the framework before the interview starts to help ensure that it doesn't go out of control while you're in the process of a meeting. Avoid embarrassing people, but also avoid having it go out of control so that you have a problem uh, before uh, you have any chance to, to deal with the situation. Uh, I've had relatively few ex cases where anybody has tried to talk with me about the case. Uh, if they do, I explain to them that I'll have to stop the interview if they're going to go into that topic, try to be polite about it. But um, this is something that everybody has to manage is to avoid getting into the substance of the case. So Sally, can I say, can I say that you readily agree to an interview, but uh, you set the parameters for the interview? I would say reluctantly. <laughs> it's not something um, I would be eager to do. Uh, and fortunately, it doesn't come up that often but it does come up sometimes. Um, it may be by telephone. Uh, you know, sometimes people will be impromptu and call by phone. And there, I think, again, make sure you're close to a pad of paper, be able to take some notes. You need to keep a record about the conversation if somebody calls by telephone and wants to have a casual conversation. That definitely is a good tip, to keep notes of what happened and what's been discussed. In fact, an email to set the parameters that you wish them to, or framework they wish them to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, discuss is a very important tip that uh, we all must learn. Uh, Michael, you have experience as well, right? Uh, Dr. Michael Wang? Unmute, Mike. Unmute your mic. Apologies. Um, it used to happen in the earlier part of my career when I was not so well known. And you can imagine sometimes uh, a lawyer uh, may have heard of you, but has not met you personally in the international arena. Uh, and especially his client may say, well, if I'm going to entrust this uh, very big uh, case to this particular arbitrator, I'd like to just uh, meet him to get a feel of what he's like. Um, and, uh, sorry, I'm not seeing the screen. Uh, am I still audible? I think, uh, Lu Song probably, Professor Lu Song probably accidentally shared the screen. You just carry on. We can see you. Uh, okay. So, um, and I tell them, look, I have a few ground rules. Uh, one is the one that uh, Sally mentioned about taking notes, but I go, uh, one step further. I say that I will have somebody sit in with me, uh, usually another lawyer, and he or she will take notes. And these days, you know, with iPhones, frankly, you might as well take a recording. Um, and secondly, I say, if you're going to have an interview, my place, not yours. Uh, psychologically, it's not good for you to be seen going to a party's office, even his lawyer's office. On that, Michael, are you, do you always agree to go for a physical meeting? 
Oh, if they ask it, and exactly for the first reason I said, um, it's not so much the lawyer, it's the, really the client, and they actually just want to have a feel uh, of the person, particularly, I suppose, if they're thinking of that person as possibly the, uh, the chair. But that's another story, because we generally don't encourage uh, meetings uh, with people if you are being considered as sole arbitrator or the chair. Is that, that's too sensitive. Uh, but one thing, a uh, very, very practical thing I say is, I limit the time to 45 minutes. See, half an hour may be a little bit short. And I may actually want to ask questions uh, about what kind of issues come up in the case. That's my main concern these days. If you ask, anybody ask me to take it on the case, I want to know that it's a case I will feel comfortable in handling in terms of what the issues are. So I usually have a discussion with the lawyers about that. Um, and uh, one hour sounds just a little bit too long. So 45 minutes, you can easily say, if I was asked about it later, it was less than an hour. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. In fact, I would have thought that 45 minutes is far too long. Yeah, if they just want to get to know you, why would you take one hour or 45 minutes to say so many things? And in terms of what you just mentioned, the last ish, the quest, uh, uh, point you made is, to, to understand the issues and in front of the clients or just with lawyers, because that might be something, uh, uh, an issue frame or suggestion from a lawyer may be quite uh, influenced by their own case. So how do, you, uh, how do you digest that in terms of your willingness to, or, or lack of willingness to uh, be engaged in the, in the, in the arbitration? Uh, I need to know um, what is the main area in dispute? Of course, they can give a subjective view, but I just want to get um, the nature of the dispute in terms of my ability, my, my own perception of my ability to handle that kind of dispute. I mean, I, I'm not the kind of person who says, I can do any dispute under the sun. Uh, and especially now at this stage, I'd like to just specialize in something that I feel comfortable with. Uh, it's better for me, it's better for them that they have somebody who is comfortable with the issues. So it's really a question of whether or not I'm suitable for the case, or the case is suitable for me. Do you, like Sally does, uh, set them the parameters and framework as to what you will talk about and not talk about? Oh, yes, yes. yes. Well, actually, the short answer is maybe I'll send them a copy of the Chartered Institute gu guidelines. Yeah, no, but, but uh, you would not like tell, you just send them the, uh, the guidelines, is it? And not say that uh, what you do. And would you also allow them to record your interview? Have you if, ever if I recorded? Then I would be recording it myself as well at the same time, so that we both have a, a recording. Okay. Uh, but it, it it just hasn't happened okay. uh, that way. Yeah. But sometimes you have to make an exception. Once uh, I was uh, asked uh, about a very very complicated case in Australia, and I happened to be going to Australia, so I said, "Look, the best way to get to this uh, is to have a face to face conversation." Because it's a very, very complex case. Multiple uh, cases were going on. Uh, and this was just part of the whole fabric. So we had to spend more than an hour uh, to discuss, just so as you could understand what was the significance and who were the other parties involved in possible conflicts and so on. I suppose that's a special case. And you would not normally offer to meet them, right? No, not normally I wouldn't. But so I'm I think very comfortable with Australians. <laughs> I used to. <laughs> That's good. That's good. Yeah. Okay. What about um, uh, my, uh, Lawrence? Uh, you have uh, anything to add to this? Well, I thought I would add, uh, in addition to what Sally and Michael said, that uh, in international arbitration, it's a bit different from, from a court environment in the sense that the parties do have an interest in ensuring that uh, they have a tribunal who is capable, competent, fit for the job, ultimately uh, suitable. And that's, that is what I got from what uh, Michael said. But the counterbalance to the, uh, to the interests of the parties in having the tribunal um, that can do the job, of course, is um, Sally's point about setting the parameters, which I'm very much in favor of. And the earlier it's done, preferably before the interview, uh, the better. I, uh, what I, uh, am constantly uh, thinking about is the extent to which an arbitrator having undergone an interview on proper parameters 
needs to disclose the fact that he or she has undergone an interview when the tribunal is later constituted. And whether that extent of disclosure or the degree of disclosure or the need to disclose varies whether that party, uh, whether the arbitrator is a party appointed arbitrator or a sole arbitrator. I think that's one of the current uh, issues in international arbitration today. Okay, can you tell us what you expect as counsel for uh, if you, when you are acting as counsel, uh, the, the degree of disclosure from your arbitrator? Well, I would never say no to uh, over disclosure as long as it is not excessive. I would want to know everything that uh, uh, might bear on my view of the tribunal, its competence, its capability, uh, its impartiality. So, uh, and, and that's what I've done uh, as my own code uh, when I sit as an arbitrator. I believe uh, early and uh, as much disclosure as possible is, is advisable. The worst thing to happen is you get found out uh, for something you ought to have disclosed midway through the arbitration. At the very least, it doesn't do anyone any good because a lot of time and costs uh, have been wasted. Right. Actually, as counsel, as counsel, have you ever interviewed arbitrators before prior appointment? I have not. I have uh, sent emails asking uh, them, or de describing the claim in outline, asking them whether they feel uh, capable and suitable uh, to sit as arbitrator. But uh, I've not conducted an interview. Many, well, I wouldn't say many, but some have conducted an interview of me when they are considering me as an arbitrator. And uh, in one situation, at least, the interview got so extensive, I had to say that uh, I could no longer be an arbitrator, in which, but it carried on and I ended up being appointed as co-counsel for the parties. Oh, <laughs> that's interesting. <laughs> yeah, good. Thank you. Thank you. Asali. You know, one of the questions uh, that I came to my mind when I was thinking about um, this gathering uh, today is the question of yeah, at what point uh, is the communication between counsel and a prospective arbitrator, at what point does it become an interview um, that we really need to think about it as an interview? Uh, because a lot of times there are exchanges of emails. Oh, by the way, um, you know, how is your language capability if there's a language thing? Or by the way, what is your technology um, experience? And I think we need to be sensitive that even if something is not a face-to-face -face interview, uh, these parameters that we're talking about might apply even to uh, multiple exchanges of emails. Right, right. Thank you, thank you. Actually, I have a uh, more interesting question when it comes to uh, what if you are asked to appoint an, uh, a third arbitrator? You are both co-arbitrators and you're asked to appoint, a would you interview that uh, candidate or would you, has it, has it been anybody's experience that you have interviewed a third arbitrator? Uh, anyone from the panel? I, I'll just see whether anyone wants to indicate. Well, Professor Lusong, have you any experience in the area? Uh, <clears throat> not really, but, uh, uh, but there are cases where <clears throat> when I'm one of the party appointed arbitrators and I would discuss with the uh, the other party appointed arbitrators on how to uh, select the presiding arbitrators. And we will, uh, I think that the general practice that we will each uh, nominate someone, well, uh, a number of uh, candidates and we will, uh, between the two of us, we'll discuss and if we find someone that both of us are comfortable and then we will well, contact that person and to inquire whether they are interested and whether they are available uh, to be to serve as presiding arbitrator in this arbitration. Uh, sometimes they say, well, in most of the time they would like to, if it's a good case. <laughs> uh, well, sometimes you have to find the second candidate. <clears throat> right, right. What, what happens if your, your uh, appointing um, party say, can we have a, uh, um, certain qualifications to ask of the uh, third arbitrator? And they gave such a narrow qualification to the, to the extent that they actually identify a particular candidate. How would you deal with that? Uh, I think about uh, uh, 
is there any requirement or qualification requirement uh, under the arbitration agreement? First level. For instance, language requirement. Uh, and <clears throat> secondly, uh, I think um, a requirement which will uh, be inconsistent with a with uh, with the uh, the person that who is capable of conducting the arbitration efficiently and with experience. That will be uh, my consideration. But beyond that, well, uh, I don't have that experience, but if we say uh, we would like to have a, a woman arbitrator, uh, we would like, to, well, well, uh, the other thing would be uh, the governing law would be another uh, consideration. Uh, the, it will be helpful where the presiding arbitrator is is knowledgeable about the governing law chosen by the parties uh, and language as, as I have mentioned. But beyond that, I don't think anything would be very reasonable. Well, it depends on, on circumstances. Thank you. Would, would have anyone any experience where a, uh, the appointing party uh, asks you to propose certain names or a particular name as chair? Uh, of the tribunal, or and how do you react to that, uh, Sally? Um, it, it's happened a few times. Um, it's relatively unusual. Um, it, it normally goes in the other direction that the uh, two co arbitrators think of some potential candidates and they may send a letter to the parties and say, um, Do you have any objections or do you have any preferences for this list that we're coming up with? But um, I have had. Um, parties suggest um, specific candidates for president and, and, and of the tribunal. But of course, uh, one arbitrator is in no position to uh, make any promises. Uh, everything, it depends on the procedure that applies to the appointment of the chair, plus uh, the other protocol that are in place for the particular appointment. Professor Liu, uh, Professor Liu Tinto, any anything to yeah. say in this? Uh, yeah, I want to raise a question for the other <laughs> uh, panelists uh, about this issue. Uh, I, I know you have uh, give us a very excellent uh, uh, some things about uh, the uh, choice of the arbitrator. But my question is how to balance the arbitrator's independence uh, between your connection with the arbitrator uh, at first, uh, you have just said uh, you have to uh, email, uh, uh, write email and interview uh, with the arbitrator. How to guarantee your idea uh, uh, what, and what you said cannot affect the arbitrator's uh, attitude? Uh, how to uh, make the, the, the case uh, uh, fair? not unfair uh, because your uh, uh, interview and your email uh, with the arbitrator. My question. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Professor Liu. Anyone wants to respond to that? I suppose, I suppose Professor Liu's question uh, uh, is a caution to all of us who are involved in international arbitration to ensure that the tribunal and the members who are appointed, including uh, the chair, is uh, do not lack in impartiality, remain independent at all times. So when we recommend uh, arbitrators or as chair, uh, candidates as chair, we must be conscious of that. And, uh, yeah. and when the party nominating us as a party appointed arbitrator proposes a name, we also have to be the safety check for that, right? And we, we do have that uh, duty, I believe. Uh, Dr. Michael Huang, anything to add? No, I think not, not on this topic. Okay, okay. Oh, well then, another topic that you that come to mind on, on appointment, do you have any? Otherwise, uh, we can move on to um, the uh, second thing about conflicts of interest, you know, conflict checks. Some of you have been uh, in big law firms before and uh, uh, all of you actually maybe have been in big law firms before and uh, probably have uh, this, this kind of issue and that is the, the extent of disclosure, what kind of conflicts checks do you normally go to 
when you are approached for appointment. Lawrence State, I think you are in a big firm currently. So let us know, what do you normally do? Well, as you say, I belong to a very, very large uh, firm, not just uh, in Singapore, but globally as well. So uh, conflict checks uh, are quite elaborate on my part because uh, my firm uh, maintains a global approach to conflicts. Um, I'm required to do a global search across all of our um, offices worldwide. And very often, someone would raise uh, an issue, a question or a concern about my uh, accepting an appointment as an arbitrator. Uh, you know, I maintain both the practice as counsel as an arbitrator. I'm not yet a full-time arbitrator. So one of the realities of uh, accepting appointments from time to time uh, or considering appointments from time to time is that uh, conflict issues uh, remove me from consideration. When I uh, conduct a conflict check, uh, I don't just do a conflict check on the parties, but uh, their relationship within a wider group as well. Uh, my firm uh, maps links, particularly uh, between major groups of companies down to shareholding. Uh, and uh, my policy, as I mentioned previously, is to uh, disclose early and possibly to the point of over-disclosure. Uh, I think for me, in my current position, that is the best policy. Uh, and I would rather the parties get uh, uh, slightly annoyed that I'm uh, over-disclosing and, 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 and um, telling them more than they want to hear, then run the risk that they say you haven't disclosed something. And, and, and as, as I've said, at the very least, that leads to a wastage of time and costs if, if uh, someone in my position has to resign from the tribunal. It right? doesn't do the parties uh, any good. Uh, the worst scenarios are, don't get any better. So that would be my approach uh, to, to conflicts checks. Right, thank you. Sally, you have been in a large law firm for many, uh, several large law firms for many years, especially in Asia. I'm sure at some stage you, uh, you uh, but you have of course left uh, practice for a long time as well. How far would you go back making disclosures in terms of uh, possible conflicts? I think that the general rule of thumb is you know, at least 10 years. Um, and I would also just second what uh, Lawrence has said is that it, it is indeed very challenging to have an active arbitrator practice uh, because of the expectations for a global comprehensive uh, conflicts check. But uh, beyond the 10 years, it's more than that, I think. If a client beyond that was a particularly important client, you may even want to go beyond that. Uh, it's very hard, I think, to uh, set a, a black and white uh, rule and simply apply that and nothing more. Mm. Uh, one of the best uh, rules of thumb that I've heard is that anything that comes to mind, if it comes to mind, if it creates a doubt, it's probably something you need to disclose. So you, you go by feeling, is it? Anything that comes in addition, in addition to the to the to the general protocol. Right. right. Of uh, course, uh, I think our listeners should be aware that there is the IBA uh, rules on conflict of interest, international arbitration. You should go well get uh, a copy of that if it's not already in your uh, um, uh, student package. Uh, attendee package. So get rid, uh, get hold of that and uh, uh, memorize every rule. No, of course, that's a joke. And um, uh, be, be familiar with it. And, and uh, you should um, therefore uh, not worry too much because it's quite comprehensive. Uh, Dr. Michael Huang, uh, have you ever uh, had this kind of experience where you have conflicted uh, out quite often? Not, not more recently, right? I think in previous years, you probably had a lot because you're in a large law firm. Uh, yeah, as soon as I had decided that uh, I wanted to concentrate on arbitration, uh, I left my firm <clears throat> and started my independent practice. Um, so that uh, these days, it's relatively easy uh, because uh, I just keep a list of all the arbitrations I've done since I set up my uh, own firm. Um, I, I really don't go back to the time that I was in my uh, old firm and had uh, relationships uh, with um, those clients because that's now long past. Um, but I can pretty well remember all the names. 
Uh, I have not done that many arbitrations, probably much less than you, Lawrence, so that I can just look at a name of a party and I said, well, I looked at that name. That's not a case that I've done. Uh, and the conflict search is very, very fast. Um, but uh, if you do SIAC cases, uh, this is interesting. Uh, SIAC, I think, has a, a method that uh, prompts uh, the uh, potential arbitrator uh, because at the time that you are nominated, uh, if you're a party appointed or you are provisionally uh, chosen by the parties to be the chair, uh, then SIAC will send you uh, the code of ethics. And in the code of ethics, they then list these are the names that we have assembled uh, where you need to check for conflicts. Uh, it's actually very comprehensive. It's probably over comprehensive because it includes the names of lawyers as well. Uh, and then you, you know, have to say, of course, I know that lawyer, but you know, nothing special. Um, but that's uh, what you have to look out for. I, I agree with you. Um, uh, I think generally speaking, uh, if you want to use a criteria at all, uh, then you uh, should use the IBA guidelines. Uh, but I'll give uh, people another tip. If you are doing an ICC arbitration, ICC have never considered themselves bound uh, or constrained by the IBA guidelines. And they have their own guidelines. Uh, and the problem is that the guidelines are not really codified uh, in a convenient place. And where you will see their guidelines or disclosures is actually too late. Uh, it, it comes at the point after you have been approved and after you have been appointed, then they send you a guide. and say, these are our guidelines for how you conduct. And then they tell you what the rules of disclosure are, which are a little different from the, uh, I, uh, the IBA guidelines. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you for pointing out. In, indeed, SIC has, uh, when they send you the uh, possible appointment for conflict checks, they give you not just the parties, but who are the people who may be linked to the part named parties. And I think it is very useful, but it's still, they always add a caveat to say, this is not comprehensive. This is uh, known, what is known to them. So they actually give you a, uh, they sift through the documents and give you a possible list of people who might be involved in the case, which is very helpful. I think that is something, uh, I, th I think ICC doesn't do that as well. And many uh, other institutions don't do that. So it is a uh, hard work on the part of the secretary I must uh, congratulate them and thank Michael for uh, highlighting this. It is indeed a very useful list. What about uh, in China, uh, Professor Lu Song and Professor Liu, have you any experience, maybe starting with Professor Lu, uh, any experience here with um, parties um, uh, not making proper conflict, arbitrators not making com proper conflict checks and have got themselves into uh, some knots later? Professor Lu? Well, thank you, uh, Lawrence. Before I uh, answer this, uh, there are some questions from the. Uh, oh, let uh, me see. Yeah. yeah, but you you can look have a look at that. Uh, I think in mainland China, uh, this is a uh, uh, well um, the uh, well the pre uh, pre uh, pre in, pre appointment interview with arbitrators is a very sensitive and uh, matter. Uh, well, that is the previous topics we talk about. And when people uh, come to the uh, conflict of interest chat, um, I think if you stay with a law firm and the law firm will have a system of uh, conflict checks. But if you are an <clears throat> independent arbitrator, uh, it's uh, much more simpler. Uh, I mean, uh, each individual, uh, each independent arbitrator will have its own uh, database, <laughs> and they will <clears throat> um, they will check whether the uh, acceptance of the appointment will uh, be in conflict with some of the other cases. Uh, well, the I, I think the most often situation I encountered is is not conflict with the parties or with the lawyers, but some lawyers or many lawyers uh, serve 
as counsel in one case and arbitrator in other cases. But, uh, I have uh, a couple of cases where my co-arbitrator would serve as counsel in another case where he is the lawyer I serve as arbitrators. But that, that would be uh, the normal situation I encounter. Mm. Uh, but apart, apart from that, um, I think an independent arbitrator do not have any more conflict issues. But if you serve as a lawyer in a big law firm, yes, uh, you will have uh, multiple conflicts. So uh, like Sally and uh, uh, I think Mike Moser as well. And they previously uh, uh, as a counsel in a law firm and then they uh, left the firm and become independent arbitrator. One of the reasons is to try to minimize the conflicts. Thank you. Thank you. What about, what about situations? Okay, maybe Lawrence, you want to uh, um, say something? I think there's a question from Aziz. Yes. Uh, well, I, I'm not a professional arbitrator, so I haven't really turned my mind to the extent of uh, conflict searches necessary. I know Michael and, and Sally have spoken a little bit about that. Uh, what I do in terms of my conflict search is very much uh, a, a product of the system that my firm has set up. Uh, and I would agree with the sentiments expressed so far that the SIAC approach to conflicts is very useful. I, I look forward to getting the extra names. Uh, sometimes it's names of uh, persons as well uh, who feature in the correspondence and I run a check on all of them. Uh, it gives me the confidence that even though my firm is a global one, you know, I've been conscientious, I've, I've done a, a search and you know, if there's anything, as Sally says, that gives rise to a doubt, I would just disclose it. Sometimes it's a matter of building a trust between the parties as well, that you're seen to constantly disclose so that when the time comes where a matter that gives rise to uh, doubt and, and, and the need for, for consideration comes up, by that time you've built up that trust, the parties believe that uh, you're conscientious in, in conflict. They are more prepared to waive uh, that issue than if you had not built up uh, that trust for that relationship. Right. Thank you. Thank you. I think the uh, short answer in terms of uh, disclosure and conflict checks is uh, that in larger law firms, you probably have a, a bigger issue there. But for independent arbitrators or those of us who are already out for a long time, no longer in large law firms, then it, it is much easier in a sense. That's right. But the problem is sometimes, the, uh, uh, even in, for, for independent arbitrators like us, sometimes we, we uh, uh, have situations in which our co-arbitrators are also um, arbitrating in other related matters, you know, where there's a string uh, of arbitrations arising from the same subject matter or the same party. So that kind of situation may also be quite tricky. You know? Maybe we don't go into that unless somebody wants to comment. Um, anyone wants to comment on that? Uh, where you are, you are sitting in arbitration with co-arbitrators who are also sitting in, a, in a, another parallel arbitration uh, involving same parties, and they may have information from uh, that arbitration which you do not have. So how do we like, uh, make disclosure of, of the possible, is it a possible conflict that you will consider? Um, Michael, anything? Yes, it does sometimes uh, arise, but it usually um, manifests itself uh, at the beginning because you know that there are parallel uh, cases going on. And so one has to consider, but in sometimes uh, you actually overcome the problem in a way by uh, combining related uh, cases for hearing. Um, and this will lead us on to another subject about, you know, how, what happens when you consolidate uh, or you don't consolidate, but you actually have physical hearings uh, joining two arbitrations in the same hearing. Um, and then you kind of resolve that, those kind of conflicts that the knowledge from one gets passed on to the other. So everybody can see what they're just 
But usually it's when the issues are very close and it's yeah. just a choice of party that's different. Thank you. I think we will stop there because we will, will not want to go yeah. into the, uh, in terms yeah. of, oh, yeah. sorry, sorry, Professor Luzon. Yeah, I, I think this is quite common. <laughs> Uh, it's happened many times in mainland China. All right. Uh, the parallel cases or related cases in the uh, institutional arbitration practice in mainland China, mm. many institutions prefer to nominate the same presiding arbitrators for the related cases uh, with the purpose of ensuring that those cases are decided Constantly, I mean, uh, not, uh, 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 well, in a similar way or, or with a simil similar uh, uh, outcome. I mean, uh, uh, not one case, not the uh, similar facts and the same parties and one panel will decide this way, the other panel will decide the other way. That will be, uh, uh, will be an awkward, uh, situation if both cases are administered by the same arbitral institution. So that's very common. Uh, I think that the practice that uh, uh, the institutions uh, by nominating or appointing the same presiding arbitrator uh, <clears throat> to ensure that uh, they, the, the, dis the similar dispute are decided uh, <clears throat> similarly but in each case, uh, the tribunal would only decide the dispute based on the submissions and evidence presented in that particular case. Uh, sometimes the tribunal would uh, draw the attention to the parties and their counsels uh, to some issues. Well, if, well, of course, they, they have knowledge of other cases. They know facts. They are not particularly argued, there are no legal issues, they are not particularly argued in this case, but they do in other cases. So uh, it's, it's, it's a way, uh, it's the presiding arbitrator try to, uh, you know, uh, try to uh, reach the same result. And, but they, but so, you know, you know, in this way that uh, <clears throat> to ensure that the cases are decided uh, in the, in the, along the line of the same uh, uh, decisions. That's the it's the consistency. Yeah, consistency. That's right. Yes, I think the the, the desire to uh, to achieve consistency is always good, but um, uh, with uh, different panels, um, maybe one common arbitrator, even a presiding arbitrator. Uh, may have uh, a certain influence over this outcome of the other cases. So I think there, there are good things and bad things about it, advantages and disadvantages. I suppose the arbitrating, the administering institution, um, if it's an administered arbitration, of course, they are more conscious of it. But of course, in ad hoc arbitrations, maybe that is not something that, uh, that is something that we got to be a little bit more cautious about. Okay, let's move on from there. I want to go on to the uh, next topic, which is about running an arbitration. Because parties, of course, look to arbitration uh, for an end result, and they do not want delay in arbitration. And of course, it is the duty of the arbitrator to uh, balance fairness, justice, ex against expedition and economy and, uh, uh, in the conduct of arbitration. So here I want to ask whether, <clears throat> um, just, just as a starter, whether uh, are you in the practice, for example, of bifurcating um, uh, the process? In other words, dividing uh, for the for the sake of uh, the audience, bifurcation in, in arbitration sometimes quite is done that to to have discrete issues being decided at different tranches and different stages, and uh, that sometimes is uh, faster, but it also can also can also prolong the process. And I just want. Uh, our tribunal, so our, our speakers here to share their experience. Uh, Professor Lu, you were last on the line. Would you want to say something about this? <clears throat> uh, yes, well, I think that depends. Uh, if, firstly, uh, there shall be an uh, objection to the arbitral jurisdiction. Hmm. Uh, uh, if, if that is the case, and you, when you 
preview the uh, case file, and you think there is a there is a fair possibility that that objection may succeed. So in that case, well, uh, my uh, personally, I would prefer to to bifurcate the case uh, to uh, <clears throat> ask both parties to concentrate on the jurisdictional uh, challenge issue. Uh, then when we solve that, well, well the, the outcome would be two, well, there would be two ways. One is that there is no jurisdiction and that's the stop of the uh, uh, foot stop. And if the tribunal decides that uh, we do have jurisdiction, then we'll move on to the merits. So, um, so when uh, that that is one situation, well, <clears throat> uh, yes. second situation, well, well, under the CAC rules, you have an, an early dismissal of application of defense. If one party raised that uh, application, then well, of course the tribunal will read the files and have their preliminary thoughts, and if if they think that would be uh, reasonable, then the tribunal may concentrate on that particular issue first, and that will be a uh, uh, result in an efficient proceedings. And, and and third situation, I could think. Well, when you say any, well, the question I I, I saw the question and any particular uh, consideration. Uh, <clears throat> uh, it's also common that the respondent defaults entirely <laughs> in that Too situation. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, in that situation, the tribunal would uh, also have uh, make take that into account. Uh, of course, you don't need in that situation. You don't need pro documents production, um, but you have to ensure the uh, proper notice gave the respondent the reasonable chance to uh, state its case. But if he continue to default, then you move on. Uh, well, that's that's one. <clears throat> Okay, I, I think that. Thank you, thank you. I think um, that, that brings me back to um, uh, an important stage in the process of arbitration. Once you're appointed, normally we would have what we call a conduct a case management or preliminary meeting with the party. So set out the timetables. And of course, bifurcation is probably one of the items that may be considered when, if there is a possible suggestion by the parties that there is a challenge of tribunal's jurisdiction. So then, uh, my my uh, question or my suggestion now is for all of you to maybe share something about what you would you like or what would be your agenda items on the first preliminary meeting or case management meeting. I'll start with Lauren State, and then well, Professor Liu uh, Liu Qingdong. Yes. Yes. Well, as as uh, the panel has noted, one of the occasions in which there can be bifurcation would be a challenge to the tribunal's jurisdiction. My approach, both as counsel and as arbitrator, is to consider the question whether in deciding the jurisdictional issue apart from the merits, the tribunal is in fact going through the facts and going through the exercise twice. Uh, if that is going to be the case, there's something to be said about that being an inefficient use of time uh, and, and costs and that perhaps there should just be one exercise where the tribunal decides uh, jurisdiction and uh, the merits at the same time. Uh, even if the jurisdictional issue is a discrete one, I think we always have to think on both sides and what happens if the tribunal says uh, that they have jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. I mean, it will elongate the proceedings. And I'm thinking in particular of procedural rules, for example, uh, in the SIAC where you have an uh, expedited procedure where the, there's an expectation that the proceedings will be concluded within a certain period of time. Under the ICC rules nowadays, uh, it's six months from the, uh, the terms of reference. Uh, and again, sometimes the argument could be there is an expectation on the parties uh, as to the conclusion of the arbitral proceedings within a certain time frame and the tribunal must take that as a factor in considering whether uh, there should be bifurcation or not. That, that really uh, was my view. The, the, the other point that I want to, to leave everyone with is that uh, 
I don't think it is appropriate to decide bifurcation on, on uh, jurisdictional issues until the statement of defense is filed, because under Article 16 of the model law, for those of us who have uh, the model law as part of their law, uh, that is the very last moment that the respondent ought, or, or the, the respondent to the claim or counterclaim ought to uh, state any challenge to jurisdiction. Thank you, uh, Lawrence. Uh, I was ask, actually asking for what kind of agenda items you would like to put on your first preliminary meeting or case management conference. If I understand you correctly, you are saying that uh, you would consider that as a, one of the agenda items, but you would suggest you are not in favor of, uh, of launching into that until after the defense is filed, which is the last day of the uh, of, of a party may able to do raise that such a defense. That's Professor correct. Liu, you have anything to add on the, in terms of what would you like to say or con, uh, consider as the things to decide yeah. at the first preliminary meeting? Yeah, uh, comparing to uh, other distinguished uh, panelists, uh, I have a very few uh, uh, experience in international arbitration because uh, two years uh, ago, I uh, come back from the Suha. So I have some friends in the Super People's Court. I'd like to uh, make my unique contribution by sharing my experience in, uh, as a judge uh, in the uh, SPC and the arbitrator uh, in international arbitration cases. Uh, in talking about the difference role in uh, inf uh, in uh, infection uh, managing a case as judge as arbitrator, I would like to briefly lift uh, several uh, talking points for your uh, reference. The first, I think judges are adjudicate adjudicator appointed by Congress, you know, uh, in contrast, arbitrators as handpicked by the parties often based on the, their legal ex expertise and the industry experience, as most uh, arbitrators are experts in particular fields of law and have experience in particular business sectors. Arbitrators taking an oath to be fair and impartial and apply the law as to judges. The second, I want to say judges answer to, the, to no one but the law. However, arbitrators answer first and foremost to the parties and their business needs. Although most arbitrators have the practice law and the trial lawyers, and they are required to manage the arbitration process, their principal focus is not on court procedure. Rather, the arbitrators focus their attention to the substantive law and the fact of dispute. The parties expect the arbitrator to use their legal and industry background to make fair, just, and business practical decisions. The third and the last, I think, uh, judges are experts at court uh, pr procedures, including pre-hearing practices and the managing the courtroom. Under a strict civil procedure law, arbitrators enjoy higher flexibility to deal with, especially international commercial disputes. The arbitral process uh, allow arbitrators to implement innovative solutions proposed by the parties and uh, accommodate the parties and the council on the scheduling and the process. Uh, uh, it's a different situation. As a judge, ju a judge's de decision are subject to review by appellate courts. Also, uh, only a few trial cases are appealed. However, treaters must have clear understanding their decision is final and binding without further appellate body to review. I want to say <laughs> this. Thank, okay. thank you, Professor Liu. Professor Liu, of course, is uh, just stepped down from the Supreme People's Court as the uh, Vice uh, President of the uh, uh, Division Number no. Four, which is the International Division of the Supreme Court of China. And we are very thankful for you 
Professor Liu for sharing with us your experience comparing uh, arbitration and court processes. I'll ask Bing, uh, Sally to uh, share her, her preference in terms of the agenda items you would like to discuss at the first preliminary meeting or case management conference. After that, I'll ask Michael to chip in as well. Michael has right. loads of experience in this area. <laughs> Sally. This is usually a meeting that takes place very early on, um, oftentimes before the parties have uh, made their submissions on both sides. So uh, it, it normally will deal with procedural issues uh, because it's too early to get into the merits issues usually at that stage, unless submissions have been made already. Uh, the usual goal is to establish a basic understanding and agreement as to what the procedures will be, the basic procedures of the arbitral procedure going forward. Um, one of the first issues that I would raise is the method of communication. Uh, is it acceptable to communicate by email, for example? Something simple like that. But uh, in order to avoid any misunderstanding about what constitutes a uh, effective uh, communication among the parties and, and tribunal going forward, and, and also the contact details for each party. These are basic things. And then the final basic thing, basic, basic, is the time schedule. Normally, um, before a preliminary meeting, I would ask the parties to confer between themselves and try to mutually agree on a time schedule, including all the way up to the hearing, a basic a skeleton of, of the uh, procedures and when they will take place uh, to present and discuss during the preliminary meeting. So in the ideal situation, the parties will have conferred, they will have proposed something, and then the preliminary meeting is an occasion to go through those line by line uh, to see if everything is feasible. Uh, there are a number of bonus issues that you could add to that bare bones list that I just gave. But I think the things that I just mentioned are probably the basics in addition to asking if there are any uh, preliminary issues that, that need to be dealt with um, uh, more quickly than the, the general merits. Um, but uh, it is a moment usually at the beginning of the procedure before um, the heat rises too high in, in, in the relationship of, of the parties in, in terms of the arbitration um, overall, uh, it oftentimes is a propitious moment to reach agreement on the protocol for the hearing, um, on the format for pieces of hard evidence, and, and details like that. Um, so some arbitrators like to seize the moment when everybody is willing to agree on a lot of things procedurally to go through a, a, a long list of other details besides simply the time schedule. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Sally, for, uh, for setting. So you would set, an agenda, you would set the agenda, right? You would tell them what you want to see and uh, what we want to discuss at the uh, first preliminary meeting, right? So in a way, you sort of, I won't say dictate, you will direct them uh, wh where you want, what decisions you would like to uh, be made at the procedural meeting. Right? Thank you very much. Uh, am I right, uh, Sally? Or you leave it to the parties? I usually give a starting agenda and then I invite the parties to add any agenda items that they would right. like to add. Right, thank you. Michael, Michael, Michael will have, have many operations under his belt. He can share with us his experience. I would normally, um, Uh, convene the first physical uh, or these days virtual meeting um, at a point when the tribunal has a reasonably uh, substantive appreciation of what are the issues in dispute. And that's usually after the exchange of pleadings. So at least after the statement of claim and the defense, uh, if not, the, because if the defense sometimes raises the counterclaim, then you probably want to see the defense to counterclaim. And then we gather the meeting, because by that time then, <clears throat> uh, the tribunal can give a uh, reasoned assessment of uh, what should be the way to proceed and to appreciate what the uh, certain forensic difficulties might arise 
uh, on the side of each party and therefore certain periods need to be longer spaced than normal. Um, but once we've got that out of the way, and of course you have to issue the orders and probably the first orders that my tribunal would normally make would be to ask the parties to agree on the dates for filing of the statement of case and the defense. Uh, and then we take it from there and uh, aim towards uh, a meeting. Now, most of the institutions like to encourage that uh, the tribunals to meet physically with the uh, parties even earlier than that. And um, I, I didn't use to take that uh, advice uh, because for, for international arbitration is quite a big expense if you were to insist that everybody attends. And if everybody comes a long way and then you have a meeting which doesn't last more than two hours, which is normally what your case management conference uh, would be, uh, then it's a little bit of a waste of resources. So you try and save it for when you have something really to discuss. And to really get value out of it, uh, I would first, of course, ask them to file their pleadings. Once the pleadings are closed, then I would send them my draft procedural order and ask them to work on agreeing, like what Sally is saying, where there are dates to be filled in to see if they can agree with the schedule. Um, and then they may have individual comments uh, on the particular uh, draft orders that I'm putting out for their consideration. And we'll take uh, on board those comments. And then ideally, you, to really make uh, the physical meeting worthwhile if you're going to bring people from overseas to the seat is if there is a real issue to argue about. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, sometimes the real issue uh, is what has to be determined. Uh, in other words, they can't agree on what are the important issues. Now, issues are very uh, important to the tribunal, uh, not only to understand the factual background, but the legal uh, issues as each side sees it. So it's good to get people around. Uh, it is good to get people in the same place because then the relationship develops. The uh, tribunal can get an assessment of the uh, character of the uh, council if they are not familiar with them. Uh, it may be that some uh, council may come from a country which doesn't have a, a long history of international arbitration and um, the uh, lawyers may need to be uh, inducted in some way into the processes and the tribunal then has the opportunity to do what I call an ambassadorial role for international arbitration to explain to them and not be impatient uh, that they don't understand you know some of the things which other more experienced counsel take for granted um, and so it, it does uh, have a positive uh, impact on the relationship between the tribunal and the parties uh, and it also gives the parties themselves an opportunity to meet because they, they, they come with sometimes with uh, the, the real decision makers and they can, the parties can actually chat uh, about possible uh, settlement. Uh, and the, the, um, then the other thing is uh, that is good to link it with is something really meaty, like for example, the jurisdictional challenge. Then it is perfect to combine to get everybody to come because they have to come to argue the jurisdictional challenge anyway because so much hangs on it. Uh, so you take half a day for your procedural matters, half a day for the jurisdictional challenge, and then you fully justify that. Now that was before COVID. Yes. Now after COVID, and you're going to be touching on this later, uh, it's so much easier to convene. Then there, there may be uh, grounds for holding it uh, even earlier than what, uh, like what Sally is saying. As soon as you you start, you want to get to know people and have a chat with them. It costs very little uh, and you know it's very easy to organize. So that uh, might be an addition on top of that. Thank, thank you, Michael. I think um, from both Sally and Michael's uh, 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 contribution earlier, observations earlier, one, one will realize that in most cases, you will probably have very little, uh, if there are no, if the arbitration agreement is well written, seat is there, law is there, uh, both the law of the arbitration and law of the, uh, of the uh, substantive contract there. there. There's really very little actually for parties to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to meet 
for any other substantive purpose other than to settle the dates. But I agree, with Michael, that in fact a physical hearing, a physical meeting is very good, especially in larger cases where uh, a lot is at stake. You really want the parties really want to see the tribunal for the first time, and uh, and, and to start off right. Uh, what happens if there are actually in the arbitration gaps? We feel like language of arbitration. I know there are sometimes parties are very hung up on language, insisting that they speak on a particular language. Um, and at the same time, more importantly, the seat of arbitration. We have in Singapore one or two cases now where uh, tribunal got the seat wrong and at the end of the day, the, um, uh, the arbitration award was set aside. So issues like that would actually surface at the first case management meeting, wouldn't it, uh, Sally? Well, it's possible that if there is a gap and these issues are not addressed uh, clearly in the arbitration agreement and the parties um, are disputing these issues, they don't reach a separate agreement on these issues, that that can be identified at that stage. Um, and then the arbitrator will know that that's an issue that needs to be dealt with. I saw in the Q&A, somebody also asked, what if you don't know the applicable law? Uh, that's another example, although <laughs> the short answer to that one is that sometimes disputes on applicable law can go all the way to the, um, to the award stage. Uh, some things can be dis decided earlier, others um, less, you know, without impacting the merits of the case. Um, but, but this is actually an occasion to identify issues that are open that need to be addressed. Yes. Michael, anything else to add? I know. Well, it's interesting you raise this question of if the seat is in dispute, and sometimes even the governing law may be in dispute. And so when you have that situation, you either take it as a preliminary point and make a decision. But as you say, that decision could be wrong. Um, and whether or not that uh, then you know affects the outcome or the uh, validity of the uh, of the award is something that the tribunal always needs to bear in mind. So as a practical matter, tribunals who are put on notice that there may be a dispute about two possible different uh, laws applying either in substance or in procedure, then the tribunal will try and steer a course that will comply with both laws if possible. Uh, Lawrence, your mic, your mic is... Yes, I know. Thank you. <laughs> Professor Lu? Yes, I think uh, in, in dispute with this uh, seat of arbitration or language, I think the, uh, the first issue would be the interpretation of the contract, interpretation of the arbitration agreement. If the language is clear, there's no dispute, it's, uh, if it's ambiguous, then the tribunal will come up with his own interpretation after giving both parties and a chance to uh, argue, to state its own. Uh, but otherwise, the second level would be uh, the tribunal's decision. I mean, uh, the tribunal is empowered by the rules or by the uh, uh, lex arbitrary to decide on the seat. Uh, I think that's the end of the, <laughs> the story. But you, you, you either interpret the contract, interpret the arbitration agreement, or you make a decision. Could I add to that, uh, to what uh, everyone has said? I mean, this question of an unnamed seat in the arbitration agreement um, is an interesting one. Uh, what I would do is to make it in both parties' interests to agree a seat rather than uh, for the tribunal to, to impose a seat on the parties by telling them at this point in time, nobody knows what the result is. And whoever is the winner would not like to be visited by the issue of uh, wrong seat. Uh, and, and then I think the parties would then have occasion to try and be sensible and agree a seat. Uh, and then if I could resolve it that way, uh, uh, that'll be great because you have party agreement, party consensus. Right, thank you, thank you. Of course, there is provision in the Model Law, law or, and many rules also that if parties cannot agree or have not agreed, the tribunal actually can decide on the seat. And in ICC arbitration, it is the ICC court that decides on the seat. So there are issues here, uh, whether the Singapore court is right or wrong in insisting that the interpretation of certain clause 
that uh, gives rise to, to uh, finding of a proper C is uh, something that uh, probably requires further discussion at a different forum. But I was just want to highlight that these are issues that may be very live uh, at the stage when you commence an arbitration. There have, there have also been questions here that I have uh, wrongly uh, clicked and to say that I've answered them. Actually about trifurcation or uh, whatever, multiple uh, bifurcation or trifurcation, there can be many uh, awards in any arbitration. The tribunal can always make decisions in the tranches. So we can have um, various awards at different stages until the final award. You know, so it is possible, of course. Bifurcation is just a term to say that we can split issues. And therefore, uh, the answer to that is yes, it's always possible. And um, what about challenges of arbitrator? And I want to see if, if you, you are challenged as an arbitrator as to your lack of partiality or independent, lack of impartiality or independence. Do you deal with that um, uh, uh, upfront in the uh, uh, first preliminary meeting or you just take note of that? It's an agenda item, won't it be? Sally? Well, I think this and, and also this question about the seat, which I agree is a very interesting question. Um, sometimes um, within the applicable procedural rules, uh, there could be answers as to how these things should be decided. Um, for example, many arbitral institutions have their own protocol for dealing with arbitrator challenges. And so it will be according to the institutional rules and the institutional procedure uh, and it might not necessarily be something for the arbitrator to decide uh, freely, but, but may, there may be answers to those questions in the context of the rules. Uh, one other thing, Lawrence, that I wanted to mention is this concept of preliminary meeting is very useful in dealing with ongoing issues that come up from time to time. Uh, I normally hold a number of preliminary meetings with the parties before we get to the hearing stage. Uh, depending upon the requirements of the arbitral procedure. So uh, that's something also to bear in mind is it's not a matter of having to take care of everything in one meeting at the beginning, but it may be that from time to time uh, it's worthwhile for everybody to get together and meet and go over issues together. Right, right. Yeah. Michael, I, I know you have um, uh, a uh, a preference for a long procedural order number one. Can you share with us um, some of your uh, uh, experience or feedback on that? Uh, unmute. Yes, it's, it's long, um, but uh, mm -hmm. it kind of like, with each year of my life, I add a new one. <laughs> it's getting longer <laughs> because the PO is based on my experience you can think about something is so obvious that it doesn't need to be put down in a rule uh, but then you can always be surprised so as I said you as as my career goes on I just add one new one each year <laughs> it's actually not too bad because uh, ICA uh, everybody knows ICA the I uh, International Council for Commercial Arbitration which uh, gives a very uh, authoritative guidelines uh, has a model pr procedural order and uh, they have 22 items uh, in that model procedural order. I have 24 um, but of course uh, <laughs> that their 22 uh, items go over about three pages and my 24 go over 30 pages uh, because it actually spells out and there are many sub items uh, so I find that it, it is quite helpful sometimes uh, because there are cultural differences. Yeah. Um, I mean, Sally will probably confirm this. Uh, Non-Americans have a big problem when we go to America and you, you do an arbitration and they give you three-hole punch. Now, how many <laughs> countries in the world have three-hole punch? You only so want I, put a, I put in a specific order that if you're going to have three-hole punch, you give me a three-hole puncher. <laughs> Okay, thank you, thank you. Let me, let me just say, I mean, I, I have been asking a lot of questions, that, uh, but give me an opportunity to share this. Actually, I don't like long procedural order number one because it sort of preempts many things. And uh, as we go along, I, I, I've, uh, I've been cutting down my procedural order, order because I find that sometimes a lot of parties actually don't read them. If, if uh, for all the fine details like two holes and three holes, A4 or, 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 or legal, you know, 
uh, talking about legal in the US of, and, and Singapore and the uh, rest of the world, that, that's always very irritating to have a paper coming from uh, 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 correspondence government of the US and requiring us to print in certain sizes. Anyway, um, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm the one for short procedural orders, number one, and come up with subsequent procedural orders, two, three, and four, whatever it is, to deal with other matters. Anyway, I'll uh, leave that for another day's discussion because I've been told that we are running out of time. But I just want to respond to some questions to, uh, that have been uh, said. There are, there's a question about, um, please shed some light on Southeast Asia and the UCOS case. I must uh, apologize. I don't think this tribunal uh, is, um, should be uh, responding to this question because um, we are at this stage dealing only with procedural matters. In any case, we are only concerned with commercial arbitration. The Southeast Asia UNCLOS matters they have their own set of issues and problems. To be clear, this, uh, the UNCLOS issue on South China Sea uh, is, is not a jurisdictional, is not a sovereignty issue. It's just a territorial water, no, uh, the uh, rights to use uh, or navigation in the uh, in, in uh, international waters or territorial waters, whatever it is, is not a decision on sovereignty. So let's not go into the area and let's not discuss that. Uh, UCOS case, of course, is. Uh, one of the biggest cases in, uh, in international commercial arbitration. It also has um, uh, gone through a long history to the courts. Again, that's for another day, for another forum. Um, uh, uh, I think command everyone here to read the IBA guidelines on conflict of international, uh, of, of interest in international arbitration. So it is uh, definitely a must read for everyone who wants to be an arbitrator or wants to be involved in arbitration. A question on whether or not um, the ANSI trial rules is, is, um, uh, is efficient. I think the efficiency of any system is not, not so much dependent on the rule, but be dependent on you as the arbitrator, how you conduct the arbitration, how you push the parties and drive, push meaning driving them in a the direction you think will achieve efficiency and uh, economy. So I think that is our duty as an arbitrator. Okay. Um, uh, somebody who was just been trained by uh, Michael Huang. Okay, now my, I, I won't ask Aziz to say anything. I'll leave it to Michael to uh, answer him uh, in your own way, uh, either through the chat of a quick Q&A function or uh, anything else. I want to invite the last words maybe from Professor Liu, Professor Liu Jingtong, Justice Liu. Yeah, yeah, thank you, thank you, uh, thank you, Professor. I have learned more the, uh, experience and the knowledge from you and other panelists. Uh, and I, I want to last uh, uh, sentence to say, uh, Chinese court has um, take a very pro arbitration attitude to international uh, arbitration. Uh, for one example, uh, we inter just like uh, uh, what the Lu Song said, uh, we interpret interpret the, the clause of the arbit, uh, arbitration clause to pro arbitration. So we support international arbitration and uh, have take uh, a lot of message uh, messengers messengers to uh, support international arbitration. Thank you, thank you. I've been told time is up, but I think I'll ask uh, everyone who wish to say say something in the next 20 seconds. Uh, Lu Professor Luzon. Well, thank you very much, uh, Lawrence. Happy, uh, happy and feel uh, privileged to be invited to, to, to participate in this discussion. I hope to see you more in the future. Thank you for your contribution, Lawrence. Uh, well, I would say arbitration is a consensual process and Part of the tribunal's job is to ensure due process. Thank you, Sally. I uh, join um, my, my colleagues. This is a real honor to be here, um, including with some very old friends who go back probably as much as 30 years with me. Pleasure to be here. Uh, take a good look at the SIAC rules. That's the best practice gold standard. So I add that in addition to the, the um, the IBA guidelines, which are also well worth understanding. Thank you, Sally, for the pitch for SIC. Dr. Michael Huang, the last words. I think uh, this is going to be a very exciting year for international arbitration um, because of the world situation. It's forcing us to adapt and probably to adopt 
uh, a lot of new measures on a permanent basis. Uh, and coupled with that are interesting moves uh, on the whole fabric of international arbitration and the greater diversity of uh, arbitrators uh, and uh, counsel. Uh, and so I'm looking forward to the next few years. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. And that is uh, to wrap up. Uh, thank you, everyone. And I, 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 I believe I've given all of you an opportunity to be heard by the audience. And uh, that is a demonstration of what arbitration is all about. Uh, thank you for joining us. And uh, if you appreciate them, please give them a thumbs up as you leave. Thank you very much, uh, gentlemen.